Hey everyone, welcome back to In the Studio with Brad. Uh, with any luck, um, the audio and the video is going to be much better thanks to gifts from my br brother and, fr and a brand new camera from my wife because we were tired of uh, basically me looking like I had severe jaundice every time I was on camera. So we have a nice spiffy little ring light here, and we've got a, I guess this is a podcast quality microphone, and I even have a mixing board. I have had to work with Alana because I have absolutely no clue how to do things like mixing sound. You know, I can, I can do the up and down volume button on most uh, speakers, and that's about the extent of my... Uh, sound technology skills so you'll have to tell me if this works uh so where are we first off it's been a couple weeks so i have been generating some artwork first off i think i was working on was i working on this the last time the a piece for mutant crawl classics showing a mutant plant attack I had fun doing all of the, uh, is that getting too washed out or not? So, I mean, if you couldn't guess the fact that it was me, me and Carl Classics from the fact that the guy has is wearing cut off jeans and has four arms, you know, kind of a dead giveaway. Now, another piece I very recently finished for uh, fifth edition fantasy number four showing a couple guys fighting an ice demon. Uh, I had a blast doing this, and it took me a little while to, uh, you know, get a sense of scale. Yeah, everywhere I looked on uh, line for descriptions of ice demons, I couldn't find a sense of a uh, description of the scale. Was it like, is it five feet tall? Is it eight feet tall? It took me about 10 different trace places looking to find out that they're supposed to be considered fairly large. Lovely, eh? I should probably just go ahead and invest in a, what is a Monster Manual 27 or something? Okay, here is another piece for the same adventure showing an Abaleth. And I had a blast just doing all this woodwork in the background. And with any luck, it'll look really cool because like this little bit of its tentacle here and its tentacle up here will be protruding from the frame. You know, that's become kind of one of my signature styles. So, and finally my other piece, and I kind of went overboard on this. This is from the climactic scene of the adventure where an ad one of the adventurers discovers a planar. I guess that's what they call angels in 5th uh, edition now. Tells you about how much I know. But, so, that should be out relatively soon. Now, not related to Goodman Games. Uh, as some of you may know, I was supposed to be a guest of honor at a gaming convention outside Philadelphia. And uh, various circumstances I had to cancel, but when I had, you know, been talking to them about doing it, they had asked if I could do a picture of their convention mascot, which is this kind of elven woman uh, holding a huge sword. So I figured, it's like, okay, I can't actually attend, but I can at least do this for them. Uh, this is probably up at their website by now i don't know i haven't had time to look but there we go so i already have a standing invitation for next year so anybody who happens to be in the general philadelphia area next basically one year from this coming weekend hey stop by and say hello i should be there okay so what are we working on tonight well, as all of you probably know, DC Dungeon Crawl Classics number 100, uh, the what, the, the Spheres of Chaos, is that, that its name? Is supposed to be coming out soon. 
and this is one of the last pieces for it. So this is going to be my job for tonight. I have an elf holding a torch and looking at a, uh, hmm, um, uh, let me see, how can I phrase this? A large number of severed heads. I could say a <clears throat> load of severed heads, but you get the idea. So, with f no further ado, shall we get to inking, folks? Anybody have any questions, comments, smart-ass comments? God knows I'm usually good for smart-ass comments. What's that? I... Okay. So who's starting off the random joker fact? And why why is your voice suddenly so faint? I don't know. <laughs> I just realized yeah. that I haven't been unmuting myself in the OBS either. Um, ah. So anyway, it is your wife with the random joker fact, of course. Of course, okay. Uh, and we do, while you're fishing through that, we have a Cthulhu X in the chat. Uh, first time chatter, so hello! Um, hey Cthulhu, great name by the way. The real question uh, about one D and D is this: What will they rename I six Ravenloft, Ravenloft, uh, House of Strahd, or Expedition to the Castle Ravenloft? Blah blah blah. Uh, Curse of Strahd revamped when they inevitably recycle it yet again for one D and D. Well, personally, I think Bob Ravenloft sounds good. You know, or Bob Strahd. You know, the curse of a Baron von Bob Strahd. You know, he's he's a the Baron's you know like third cousin. You know, he actually works at the meat department down at the local Kroger's. Okay, well here we go. Hey, this is a, could be a useful one. Putting dry tea bags in gym bags or smelly shoes will absorb the unpleasant odor. Hmm, never knew that. Something to remember for the future, but please remember to take the tea bags out before you put the shoes on. Okay. Now we've suddenly turned in, turned into an episode of Strange Life Hacks. I wonder if that would help absorb the uh, smell from severed heads. What was that movie, that uh, comedy movie with uh, Joe Pesci a couple years ago, like 10 heads in a duffel bag? 10 heads in a duffel bag? Yeah, I think that was the name of the movie. I've never heard of it, but I'm interested. <laughs> I seem to, I have never I haven't seen it, but I think I saw it at IMDb because it, that's kind of a title that catches your attention. You know. And now I'm gonna go search for it. <laughs> well, you will have to share the results of your search with us. I'm pretty sure it was a Joe Pesci movie. I seem to remember the poster was like a bright yellow and the text was like all stacked on top of each other with the, the duffel bag open and of course like a bunch of heads kind of like poking out looking uh, right at very close uh it has yellow writing in it and it is eight heads in a duffel bag and oh, it is eight? a joe pesci movie <laughs> it is a joe pesci movie mm -hmm. oh hey i was close I mean, I haven't seen, I don't, I was trying to work for my uh, memories of that poster that are pro probably two years old. It's also got David Spade in it. Oh, Jesus God in heaven. <laughs> That's enough to make me not want to see it ever right there. Well, I mean, he's probably a background character. I don't know, though. He, maybe he ends up getting decapitated. That's true. Maybe he is one of the heads. Never mind. I'll go watch it. <laughs> it's kind of like that movie Collateral with uh, Tom Cruise. It's like 
Well, he ends up killed by the end of the movie. Okay, I'll watch it. So for those of you who don't know what this movie is, it's a 1997 rated R movie that's about an hour and 35 minutes. And it is a mob bag man finds that his luggage containing the proof of his gang's latest hit has been switched. Oh, Jesus, God. I didn't realize it was that old. Jeez. I thought it was a lot more recent than that. Movies are kind of weird like that. Like, you don't really realize how old something is until you look it up on, like, IMDb and you're like, really? It came out then? <laughs> yeah. Well, generally, I mean, if you see something in black and white, you know it's going to get be fairly old. You know? And once uh, color film stock became affordable, you know, that was pretty much the end of uh, black and white movies. Except for, uh, you know, like specialty stuff like uh, David Lynch's uh, Eraserhead. Oh, speaking of uh, black and white, has anybody uh, else seen uh, Werewolf by Night yet? The new Marvel uh, kind of like specialty movie? No. If not, it's a hoot. Is it? Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, they actually filmed it in black and white. Oh, that's cool. I, mean, I, was, I was a little ahead. tempted to see it, but I, like, I don't know. I have this love-hate relationship with Marvel right now. Yeah, this is one of the better ones that I've seen in quite a while. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of starting to feel the... Uh, Mar the in general superhero burnout at this point. Oh, what was you know, it? Still, uh, go ahead. Seventies, sixties, and seventies was what haunted house and ghost movies. Then you've got the eighties and nineties, which were like, I think, action oriented as well as like kind of supernatural and vampires and then now you've got the 2000s where everybody and their brother wants to make a superhero movie yeah yeah the thing is so many of them are like basically for whatever reason they're doing like really crappy imitation like i was okay like the uh, black adam movie that's coming out in uh what about a month now you know a movie about shazam or captain marvel's greatest opponent with no mention of him or what was it the uh the uh, queen phoenix uh joker movie that has no mention of batman what yeah that's the one that kind of was confusing to me because it's it's an interesting premise to have kind of like this almost origin story-ish thing but it felt so disconnected from the actual like lore per se that it just it yeah it it's its own movie it's like it's yeah. not even the actual joker it's just based yeah. off of that kind of it's just inspired by it is what it seems like to me yeah no i'm not a huge he acquainted phoenix fan anyhow so it was pretty easy for me to say yeah i'll pass actually i haven't even seen the new batman movie yet uh, it's so good <laughs> that's all i'm gonna say it's it's good and it's well that's what worth i've heard the... i usually oh. like matt reeves's stuff but i, I think it, again at this point i think it's just superhero burnout it's definitely so i can see that but it is well worth watching it and kind of you know, take it as take it as it is, and yes, it is a superhero movie. But really, if you pay attention, it is so it's such a deep dive into like character studies. I just I am wait, wait, I I'm was sorry, blown could, away. Could you repeat that? I um the so for me, it's like it it it's a deep dive into a character study. 
uh, more or less. So it's like, you know, the, the characters and their relationship to each other and the journey of the, especially the journey of Batman and what he becomes at the end. Oh my god, it's so worth it. Okay. Yeah, I I have to admit I was a bit encouraged when people were comparing it more to Seven and movies like that. I'm like, okay. It's definitely Matt Reeves uh, in his directorial style and definitely the writers uh, when they were working on this piece definitely took a lot of inspiration to from seven and that does and not bother me that doesn't bother me in the slightest bit you know and i mean i've always thought that the riddler was a greatly underused character so i was kind of happy when i saw that they were using him instead of the joker you know I just really liked that the Riddler was just some dude in a mask. Like, and they they make a point to show that in the trailer, so I'm not giving you any spoilers. Oh, no. But, like, it's, it's so interesting to see them do a different take on it rather mm -hmm. than, you know, the goofy, everybody thinks of the green suit that the Riddler has in the comics and, you know, right. in the 80s Michael uh, Michael Keaton movie. But that was uh, Michael Keaton, even... right? No, that was, no, that that was, was George Clooney. No, that was Val Kilmer. Oh, that was Kilmer. Ah, that's right. That was that one. Oh, yeah. No. Uh... Well, that was when Joel Schumacher took over the franchise and he flat out admitted the only reason they cast Jim Carrey in that movie was because Carrey was a big name at that time. He didn't give a damn otherwise. You know, he was literally just looking at like, is this character going to be right for the cat for the role? No, but he's going to be a big name, so it's, we'll cast him. I'm actually pretty sure, to a degree, that there were, um, there was some talk about how the movies. Uh, took the turn that they did, like, you know, the, the original one with Michael Keaton in it, the very first one, was uh, a little bit darker. It had some silly moments in it, but it was a little bit on the darker side. And oh, they transitioned darker. to um, being this goofy, you know, kids could watch it movie because they wanted to sell toys. <laughs> well, that sounds about right. But yeah, I mean, come on, I don't think Tim Burton is capable of actually doing a completely family-friendly movie. You know, his idea of family-friendly was, uh, you know, Mars Attacks. I don't know, The Corpse Bride isn't that bad. I'm pretty sure that was Tim Burton. It was. Fair enough. <laughs> I'm but just, I mean, like, he's... trying to think what other Disney ones he did. I guess Alice in Wonderland, even though that was kind of creepy at points. Yeah. But, okay, fair fair enough. But yeah. Um But yeah, I mean he made a point when he was doing those movies. I mean, I guess his ex his description of what he wanted when he the guy that was uh designed the uh sets Imagine if hell bro broke through the earth and kept on growing. You know, there was nothing realistic about the architecture of Gotham City in that movie. Yeah, it just was like, it just looked like New York, didn't it? Mm -mm, no, if you go back to... Uh, you will notice, I mean, there's a lot of, of really gothic looking architecture in that first movie. Oh, then yeah. You're, you're probably thinking, remembering more uh, the look of the Nolan movies. Yeah, I think you're right. I've, there have been so many Batman movies, I get them all confused sometimes. Oh, I know. <laughs> Yeah, because Nolan wanted to do the character realistically, you know, which is, if you stop and think about it, it's like, is that really that good of an idea? I this actually appreciate it. 
What's that? I appreciate it. But what, yeah, what were but you going to say? It also started falling apart because there's some of his opponents that simply don't work in anything resembling a realistic world. You know, even in the second movie with uh, the guy that they did as Two-Face, he would have been dead from shock, you know, very shortly after, after having that much of his face basically blown off. Yeah, yeah, you're definitely right. Like, there's, I guess there's, like, a bit of, um, what's the, what's the term? Um, Suspension of disbelief? Yes, thank you. My brain was wanting to say something about imagination, and that's not quite where I was going. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, you have to have a bit of that suspension of disbelief with it at the same time, because even with Bane, like, that you could... You know the whole the whole deal with Bane in the in the third movie, which I never mm -hmm. finished because I just I wasn't a big fan of it. Um, no, but I've... I appreciate the more grounded feel to the Nolan movies because, it, barring Two Face and Bane, like especially the Joker, the Joker <laughs> definitely felt like it could be a real person. Yeah, because he his face, all that he really had was you know, like some horrible scars. You know, I, I forget, what is that called? It's a Glasgow smile, I want to say. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Which, unfortunately, is a real thing. So. But, yeah. I just, I'm just getting kind of tired of an endless, you know, assault of superhero movies. Now, I am liking she -Hulk, the She-Hulk show. I haven't gotten around to watching it because when, when it was pitched to me, all I could think of was Legally Blonde. And I know that's not what they're going for, but that's all I could think of. So it was hard oh. for me to try and watch it. No, it's it's more of a straight up legal comedy along the lines of Ally McBeal or some of the shows like that, and it's hilarious because the character, the main character, talks to the audience regularly. I mean, like this, uh, this latest episode. You know, there's like a long trailing shot through her apartment. And she kind of like come, comes out of the, her bedroom and is like, what are you guys still doing here? Don't you have anywhere else to go? I mean, she's talking right to the camera. So. But if you've ever read the She-Hulk comics, she does that on a real regular basis. She's like uh, Deadpool that way. So. But other than that, I'm just getting kind of tired for the most part. And I think some of the guys at Marvel, at least, are cottoning to that because they're trying to come up with stuff that does that breaks the mold, a a.k.a. you know, Werewolf by Night, which they did in the styles of a 1930s uh, horror movie. I, yeah, that's, that's fantastic to know that they, that they did that they're catching that feel because i will say um while i didn't really like wandavision um partially because i didn't like that they made a show that ties into movies so you kind of have to watch the show and then watch you know the second doctor strange movie or you're mm -hmm. completely lost um i didn't like that because that's a big commercial move that marvel did but oh yeah i, I had a feeling they were gonna go go that route when i started hearing that they were gonna be doing marvel shows on disney plus it's like oh god please tell me they're not gonna do this yeah and sure enough it seems though that that's i believe the only one that has a heavy heavy tie-in to the movies that you kind of um, you have to watch I... it from what I understand, uh, the next Captain America movie is going to really build off of uh, the events of uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier. Mm. Oh yeah, no, they're gonna they're gonna make it sure so that 
basically if you want to know what the hell is going on in the movies you have to have have disney plus which is both from a business point of view it's pretty savvy mm -hmm. from a viewpoint of are you making good products it's pretty bad from a consumer standpoint it's horrible <laughs> yeah but it's what is it you hate you you have you hate the player but you don't hate the game you know it's yeah. like it's kind of a game and they have to play it that way if they want to make money because then why else would you buy disney plus um, and and hey if they ain't making money for disney disney will pro would probably have no problem saying like okay never mind click yeah that's true you know let us never forget the oh, the mouse can be very ruthless when it comes to that kind of stuff yeah yeah i know like um a bunch of youtube channels that all they did like it's movie reviews and mm -hmm. all they did was play very 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 minimal um clips from disney movies and they basically got the copyright hammer just because they showed just enough that Disney was like, well, you're showing too much of our movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even though, you know, you're supposed to be able to show at least, what, 20 seconds of a movie? I uh, yeah, I think um, with the way a lot of people have been going about it is I think you can have about two minutes but if you have two minutes, it has to be transformative in some way, which that's per the fair use law. With fair right. use, you can use it if you're transforming it, if it's a satire or a parody, or um, use it in an educational way. Right. It still seems like it's pretty dicey. Kind of dicey. Yeah, for the most part, a lot of people who who review Disney stuff and I believe Warner Brothers has also gotten really nasty about it too. In oh god, Warner years. Brothers is horrible sometimes. Um, I remember a lawsuit several years ago. There was like a local band down in Texas. Okay. We're talking like one of these, hey, we're gonna be playing at Sam's uh hog shed farm, you know? But the name of the group was Riddle Me This. Obviously a reference to the Riddler. They sued them. But riddle me this isn't to the Riddler. Like, anybody could say that. It probably that... didn't even come from the Riddler to begin with. Nonetheless. Well, I do remember this because I, I, I was talking to a lawyer that was part of the legal staff of Wizards of the Coast shortly after um, the acquisition. And they were explaining to me why, no, or maybe he was, this was still maybe when it was just TSR yet. I can't remember, it's been too many years. But there is an annoying little law out there that basically says if you create something for a an established product, you know, intellectual property, say Marvel, Disney, Dungeons and Dragons, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and put it in a public forum. Okay, and they do not, ch and that publication is left unchallenged. It can be used as a wedge to say, "Oh, you're not protecting your copyright." So it goes into the public domain. What? Yeah. And this was from somebody from, I th actually, I think it was TSR's legal staff. Because we got to the talking, like, you realize that with a lot of fans, you guys are not very popular. You know? And he explained it sort of like, we know, we have to be dickheads about this. But otherwise, someone could literally write up rules for a new character class post it on a you know just post it on a light pole somewhere take a picture of it 
And if TSR did not say, hey, you need to take that down, that's a violation of our laws. They could say, oh, you're not, they could take them to court, see, you're not protecting your copyright. Dungeons and Dragons is now in the public domain. Huh. I know, it's ridiculous. But it's like, that's why we have to bring the hammer down on people, you know, if they so much as, you know, write up something and post it on their, well, blogs didn't, I don't think even existed yet at the time, but if you're fanzine, in your fanzine or whatever. Charming, eh? That's fascinating, actually, because I wonder, I wonder if that's applicable in a sense today because I don't think it is I think I think copyright law and um, you know uh, publication laws and things like that what you post on the internet tagged to you like your Facebook post your um, your Twitter post your Instagram like, those are technically copyrighted images now, um, from what I understand. Taking someone else's photo from, like, a photographer and mm -hmm. posting it on, you know, your blog and not crediting. Because I know this is a big thing in journalism. If you take a photo from somewhere else, if you do not credit where you took that photo from, even if it's on something like Facebook or Instagram or wherever you got it, if you download it, put it on your put it on your blog, put it in your article, put it as I don't know a newspaper header, you know the big image on the front page. If you do not credit where it comes from, you can get slapped with copyright now because even though it's on the internet and mm -hmm. everyone can right click save it, it is still tied to that account on that person, and a reverse image search can prove it. Mm hmm. Which is also why when you're when you take photography classes, they teach you put a watermark on things because then right. there's proof that it came from somewhere else. Right. I know some of the stuff on my Etsy store I have watermarked, but you know when I'm just posting something like, "Hey, this is what I'm working on it, across my social media," I don't worry about it. But I mean, that's also why you got to be very careful if you're using photo reference on something, you know. You know, that somebody isn't going to come down on you. It's like, hey, you copyright, you copied my art, my photography, my photograph. I just posted in the chat, when in doubt, take the photo yourself. Yeah. Thing is, with if you're doing, you know, the doing artwork in the gaming industry generally does not pay enough that you can afford to hire a model to stand there and, you know, okay, now raise your arm you know, three inches, you know, while you're pretending to hold the sword, you know, because if you're only getting 40, 30 to 40, $50 an illustration and you got to pay that, the model, 30 to $50 a year, that's not a good, uh, that's not a good business model overall. Yeah, I know when I um, worked as an esports journalist last year, there were a couple of times where I had to write news articles about um, gaming tournaments. So whoever won, whoever lost, you know, I had to, I, I would find a featured image um, is what we call them. And it's basically the big image 
on the website that goes above the actual article. So it's like either underneath the title or right above the title, you have this big image. And all okay. of that, whenever I would have to publish it, um, we didn't, because I didn't have access to the back end to actually put the picture into um, the WordPress and everything and do accreditation, I would send Google Docs to my editors so that they would have, you know, this is the image that I used, here's the accreditation to it. Like, if I had a picture from, uh, if I did CSGO, HLTV is like the big giant, um, they're like the big giant news outlet for Counter-Strike Global Offensive. And so okay. I would credit, like, if I got the image from HLTV, at HLTV I didn't have anywhere else to to go to get that image or if I got an image off of I don't know a esports organization's website or Twitter or whatever I would have to put image taken by so and so from this organization right but yeah it's it's interesting because like I would argue that like you as an artist taking a photo and printing it off the internet to use as a reference doesn't go against copyright because you're not recreating that picture. You're just using that and, okay, this is how I draw a person holding a sword or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, and generally you have to change it at least, I believe, 10% before they, you know, or they can start grumbling. But, I mean, the simple fact that I'm taking an illust a photograph and turning it into a black and white pen illustration, you know, obviously I'm changing it a fair amount right there. I mean, I, I am pretty kind of scrupulous, like, even if I find, like, the best drawing for what I'm trying to, to accomplish, it's like, no. I am not going to use that. I'll keep surfing until I can at least find a photograph to work from. That way I'm not stepping on another artist's, uh, you know, style or efforts. If that makes any sense. Because I know somebody, I forget, was it... I want to say it was a cartoonist, Gene Daig, actually got in trouble several, a few years before he died because he did an illustration for Chaosium that somebody tracked down. It's like, uh, yeah, you basically essentially traced this older illustration. Yeah, that's where, that's where it gets really dicey because it's like, you can, I would argue that you can trace over something as long as you're changing it. Like, if you're not comfortable enough in your ability to draw a hand, and you get a hand, like you picture, you get a picture of a hand, or, you know, mm -hmm. a picture with a hand in the placement that you want, and you mm -hmm. trace over it, but everything else is different, I would argue that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Because I can't draw hands. I would rather trace the hand. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, sometimes, I mean, sheer necessity requires some, some, you know, you know, breaking off and tracing stuff. Um, back when I was at GDW, there was one book I had to do where I had to do like 90 headshots, not joking. Okay. And finally, after, after first, uh, the first few, I'm like, I, you, there is no way I'm going to be able to do this for 90 different illustrations and not make them all basically look all alike. So I happen to have this book that was basically just a book of headshots of different celebrities, you know, going all the way back to the 20s. And I just started blowing it, you know, Xeroxing them and blowing them up to the right, to the appropriate size and just, you know, trace away, trace away, you know, and changing details, like making like, because it was for the game Traveler, so I was like giving them more futuristic clothing. But for the most part, it's just like, there is no, this is the only way I'm going to get through this job. You know. 
little side note here, but Fregling in the chat is uh, asking <laughs> asking you and Jess. Jess already answered, but I want to hear your answer. How many severed heads do you have in your closet? Let me check. One, two, ooh, God. Hey, hon, we need to buy more formaldehyde. This one's going really bad. <sighs> you were saying. So, uh, so it's about time for some spring cleaning, even though it's about to be winter? <laughs> yeah, oh, you know. But do you have any idea how hard it is to recycle severed heads? They don't go into container. They don't get, go into cardboard. You know, and the, the garbage man really pitched a bitch the last time I got rid of a body just by taking it out to the end of the driveway and, you know, in the uh, garbage can. I, I had him bagged up. What's, <laughs> I mean, I don't know why, why he was so, so, so freaked out about it. This would be so funny to make into a sitcom. <laughs> Has no one done a serial killer sitcom yet where, like, the guy just cannot seem to figure out how to dispose of bodies, but he never gets caught? Um, not that I'm aware of, actually. All right. I mean, there hasn't it's been very many... It's on there the haven't been very many channel. shows about serial killers in general. There's Hannibal and Dexter, and those are the only two that I'm that I'm remembering. This is true, and non with notwithstanding the like you know serial killer biography documentarian style mini series things that you know Netflix is doing with Ted blah, Bundy blah, and blah. Dahmer, but it's on the Goodman Games channel. It is copyrighted. There you Nobody go. take the idea. Yes. I'm gonna write it. I'm doing it. I'm gonna write that script. Send it to I don't know Hulu or somewhere. Or oh, HBO. That sounds like a Hulu kind of thing. Yeah, it's either gonna be Hulu or it's gonna be HBO. It's one of the two. <laughs> mm, that sounds actually more more up uh, Hulu's uh, alley. I mean, they just did a. Sh the uh, show Hit Monkey. Oh, yeah, about a uh, you know a monkey that happens to be a ass professional assassin. Uh, so, note to self: cut this out of the vod so no one can steal your idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to give him some unbelievably bleh, like normal profession, like he's an accountant or a CPA or something like that. He comes into work, like, his, his white suit still has a blood stain like, right on the edge of the sleeve, and it's it protrudes just enough that it can be seen underneath his suit jacket, but no one notices, but he's freaking out about it the whole time, thinking somebody's gonna see it, and he's gonna have, he's gonna have like, all of these intrusive thoughts of, like, okay, what's my excuse? My nose was bleeding this morning. Uh, I, uh, I, I cut my hand while, while cutting a banana for my protein shake, uh, uh, I, I, I fell and scraped my wrist on, on pavement. <laughs> hey, Bob, did you go through McDonald's this morning? Looks like you got some ketchup on your sleeve. Oh, uh, no, 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 I just, uh, I cut myself cutting, cutting chives this morning. <laughs> no, that, that would be, that would be the gag that, you know, he worries, he worries himself frantic the whole time. And people just think that, you know... It's normal. Yeah. Oh, man. All right, I have to write this now. <laughs> 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 you know, I've been sitting here for, for like, I've got to say months, ever since I took my uh, media, media programming and whatever it was called. It was media programming and something class. And it was last semester, and we talked about, like, what it what it's like to create a TV show, and a lot of the times people who become, like, TV show writers make, mm -hmm. like, these 
almost fan fiction in a way scripts and i forget what the term is called there's like a specific term for it but they're they're just like burner scripts that are like here's this already existing property at your company i wrote a script and i think one one guy got uh got a script writing deal because he made a a like burner script about star trek it was like a one-off episode of Star Trek. Hmm. Doesn't shock me too much. I mean, they, it, yeah, it's called Slush Pile. You know? You know, that's how a lot of uh, stories get published. You know, they end up, you know, oh, you know, we had a slot in this issue for blah, but, you know, it didn't get through editing or the artist's or the writer flaked on us, you know, okay, grab something, but we got to do something to fill these five or six pages. Okay, grab something from the, sl the slush pile. So. Now that would be a good one for breaking the fourth wall too. Oh, you know? yeah. Oh. Breaking of course, I, the... Oh, go ahead. I, lo I, love I love stuff where it breaks the fourth wall anyhow. It's one of those things that it's like breaking the fourth wall can either turn your movie or show into brilliance on the screen or a complete and utter B-movie slock. Yeah. Well, I would not ever recommend breaking the fourth wall in any sort of serious context. You know, I mean, like Deadpool gets away with, with it, She-Hulk gets away with it, but I know if I were to wa watching a normal movie or normal drama, and suddenly one of the play one of the characters turned and started talking direct to the camera, I'd be like, uh, "You just took me completely out of the setting." Now, what was that show that was on HB? I think it was on uh, Netflix. It was like Renee Zellweger and she was like a cannibal. And it was kind of, but they were doing it like a, it was a domestic comedy. Yeah, uh, something like Santa Barbara or I can't remember. We don't have Netflix and, you know, so. You know, between Paramount Plus and HBO Max and Disney Plus and, you know, but those three channels are quite enough to keep us busy for uh, our watching. I would say I'd look it up, but I almost forgot that Netflix has that stupid autoplay on their trailers and stuff on the front page, so I no. can't look it up, because I have Netflix. <laughs> but you don't feel like having to fight through? I would rather not, you know, mess up TOS, because <sighs> it plays a trailer. <laughs> right. Also, uh, if you have a little bit of time after that head, another random Joker fact was redeemed by Jess. Okay. Give me just a second, guys. I think I'm going to have to switch over to one of the other pens. Now, how are we still doing on audio quality? 
I think it's good. Uh, okay. Twitch chat, what do you guys think about the auto, uh, blah, 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 the audio quality? Hmm. Your shoes are the first thing people subconsciously notice about you. Wear nice shoes. Hmm. Never really thought about it. Nice, nice shoes? Yeah. Huh. I don't know. I guess, you know, I do look at people's shoes a lot. I went furniture shopping yesterday and okay. oh, we're looking for a new couch and I remember going to the up to the furniture employee saleswoman um, and I remember she was wearing shoes that were the exact same color as like these like little brown patches on her cardigan and I can't believe that you you bringing that <laughs> little random tidbit out made me yeah. think of that so i guess huh. i guess it makes sense <laughs> i'm trying to remember the last time i actually like noticed somebody wearing shoes but you know we're still kind of functioning in the you know avoiding human beings stage of the pandemic you know so unless i have to go into the store I'm not really seeing too many people's feet. I, I can't even remember the last time I bought shoes. I think the last time I bought shoes was when I was working at Dick's Sporting Goods because I had to buy shoes like every six months when I was working there because I would be on my feet for so long and walk it around that I'd inevitably tear a hole somewhere in my shoes. Oh, yeah. Oh, when I was uh, working at the pizza parlor, I mean, I get, I'd get i burn through, uh, you know, tennis shoes so fast it wasn't even funny. I, I flat out started telling Jess, don't bother getting me anything nice because they're just going to be ruined in no time flat. Uh, I think the last time I spent money on shoes, it was like $60 for a pair, but they were Brooks, so they were like the really nice brand of, of running mm -hmm. shoes, and I bought Brooks that were on clearance because that particular model, style, whatever you want to call it, was going out. Like, they weren't going to make that style anymore, so I found uh -huh. it for like half off because they were normally like 120 bucks yeah but shoes are so expensive now even like the nikes that i used to buy were not quite the cheap cheap nikes because i mm -hmm. couldn't wear those because i have really high arches so i have to have a high arched tennis shoe to wear but mm. it's like the the really cheap Nikes were like the downshifters and they'd be like fifty five dollars. Then I would go to the wind flows, which were like a step up from that, and those were like sixty five dollars. And then after that it was a hundred and twenty for a pair of shoes from Nike. And I'm just like, Why? Why are they so expensive? I don't know. Yeah. But like I said, I just told Jess is like, just buy me whatever cheap ass shoes you know and if they last six months fine you know i would say i i was angry about the price but i got like 20 percent off of my shoes so they weren't really that bad at the end of the day yeah plus the good thing about pennsylvania is you don't pay taxes on clothing because it's ah. considered a necessity Oh, see, I'm pretty sure Ohio, you still have to pay, to pay tax. I think you have to pay taxes on basically everything that, except food. Yeah, in North Carolina, you have to pay taxes on everything you buy. Uh, it doesn't matter. But in Pennsylvania, clothes and shoes, I'm, I think certain foods, 
are taxable. Like I know mm-hmm. alcohol and and stuff like that is is definitely taxed, but I think for the most part, most foods I don't believe are are taxed. But I can't remember. I do not remember. From I don't remember paying any taxes uh, when we were in Gettysburg, but you know. Now, in Ohio, you do have to pay taxes on, like, pop, and, yeah, they, they, we actually call it a sin tax. So, like, if you're, you're getting pop or wine or beer or stuff like that, because that's, you know, nobody's going to really consider that an essential. But I think, you know, normal, like, grocery-type stuff... Do you do you guys have cuz it's been so long I didn't even pay attention when I went to Origins but do you guys have um beer and liquor uh stores like beer stores that are separate like you can't buy beer at a grocery store Um they just have to have them in their own se- section Okay yeah that's how it is in North Carolina where like there's a whole beer aisle in the grocery store where you'll get all of your beers but in Pennsylvania beer stores are separate from wine and liquor stores cuz like wine and liquor is its own is its own thing but beer stores are also a thing so anytime you need to get like a six pack unless you go to Giant or Wegmans but they are technically considered uh they technically have a restaurant license so you can <laughs> only buy so much beer and alcohol at grocery stores that have it or uh yeah grocery stores like beers ciders and seltzers are all in um and i mean like hard seltzers they're all in like a their own section and wine as well can be sold at grocery stores but they have a restaurant license which i found out new year's eve because i was trying to buy like I don't know. I ha- I was having people over that I didn't know, so I'm just like, okay, I'm going to buy some IPAs. I'll buy some, you know, lagers. I'll buy some ales. I'll buy some cider because I have no idea what these people like. And I tried to buy, sure. like, all of this different beer at a giant. And they were like, mm-hmm. hey, you can buy this, but I need to hold half of your purchase. You need to leave the store, put what you just bought in your car and come back and buy the rest because I'm not allowed to sell it to you all at once. <laughs> oh, jeez. That's how Pennsylvania be. It's so great. <sighs> oh, well. <sighs> and I'm not even done with what... 25% of these heads. Mm. I gotta figure out some way to streamline this a little bit. That is a lot of heads. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but not sorry at the same time. Jess says, think of it this way, Brad. You'll be ahead of the game whenever you're done. <laughs> Boo. Yes. Boo. <laughs> I, for one, loved it. <laughs> the bad thing is, I mean, this is actually really mentally exhausting trying to do this many, this much stuff because you can't just kind of go into, you know, autopilot mode for illustrating, you know? You're trying to think how to make each one look somewhat distinctive.
Oh well, tis the job, I know. I'm just trying to figure out how your, like, wrist hasn't fallen apart from all of these, like, tiny itty-bitty movements you're having to do. Surprisingly, yeah, you would think I would have horrible arthritis by now, but, uh, other than a period a few years ago when I did have to wear a glove to, uh, draw for any period of time, it doesn't bother me. I'm jealous. Because I I spent four and a half, almost five hours editing uh, a video once because the audio uh, was kind of all over the place. Okay. And I had to, like, constantly make these, like, itty-bitty minute movements, like, holding down the mouse and dragging the audio up or down whenever I needed to. And, man, mm -hmm. the next day I was like, I have to wear a brace. My wrist is broken. <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't worry. I I make up for it with the amount of arthritis I have in other parts of my body. Trust me. Ah, see that there. There it is. That's the kicker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I about died uh, the day at Gen Con that we did the. Uh, the artist's uh, meeting thing or interview thing. That's a long way from Lucas Oilfield. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, me and, me and Chris Harness and both, we just were like, oh. Uh, I think he actually just kind of gave up uh, for the day after that and went back to his room, he just like, I do not have what it takes to go all the way back to Lucas Oilfield from here. We gotta get you guys some, uh, some chariots. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I only made one round of the, uh, exhibit hall, the whole, whole convention. I'm not gonna lie, I did it twice, because I did it during my break on the first day, uh, because the room that I needed to set up in, uh, I believe Joseph was using for meetings or something, so I was like, okay, that's perfect, I get, like, you know, two hours to walk around the exhibit hall. I spent, right. like, 30 minutes trying to figure out the maze that was the exhibit hall <laughs> and mm -hmm. I got intimidated and then the last day of the convention I spent time and found the gaming honors booth um, because I hadn't gotten the chance to meet them yet so I, I went to their booth and found it and man I was just intimidated by the amount of people and apparently that wasn't like how many people went to Gen Con was not the same amount of numbers that they normally get, and that just scares me to think oh, about. Oh, no. Um, Gen Con 50 was an utter madhouse. I mean, it's... Ugh. I still shudder remembering that. Well... One thing that did not help was they had the loudspeakers going, and so every like two minutes or so, the loudspeaker or loudspeakers were coming on, you know, announcing you know this or that booth deal at this or that booth, like at volumes where I think you could have heard it up in Chicago, you know. So I mean, you're you're at the booth and you're trying to you know make a sale to someone and all of a sudden you know you basically they can't hear you you can't hear them yeah i think they must have gotten a fair number of complaints because i noticed by the next year the uh loud loudspeaker interruptions were few and far between 
like they only came on the loudspeakers if it was something that people actually needed to know. So. But yeah. So Gray Faith in the chat says that it's looking freaking awesome, and it looks like uh, we're doing a faceless god drawing from Game of Thrones. <laughs> uh, since I haven't watched Game of Thrones, I'm afraid I do not get the reference, guy. I tried reading a was a Song of Fire and Ice. You know that like the very first Game of Thrones novel. I think I got, I don't think I even got through the first chapter before it's like, no, I can't do this. I have not read them. My parents have read all of them up until the very last one. Um, but I, I never got around to, to reading it because I kept looking at it and when I found out about George R. R. Martin, I was like a teenager because there, it was always on the bottom of, like, my dad's fantasy shelf because it was just massive books. <laughs> right. So I never really paid attention to them. And I was, like, going through my dad's library one day, and I saw them, and I was like, I picked it up, and I went, I'm already reading a really big book. I don't want to, I don't want to pick up another one. Because I was reading Harry Turtle Dove at the time, mm. and those are big books. <laughs> right. Yeah. I just, for the most part, R Martin's writing leaves me cold. You know, I mean, I liked that vampire novel that he read, but pretty much everything else by hi him that I have read has been like, okay, I read a story. On to the next one. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, maybe just me, like, it's, I feel the, kind of the same way about uh, the late Peter Straub, just like, okay, he's good, he's solid, but there was no, I need to read the next book by this author. It's now, me. like, oh, go ahead. Now, Joe Lansdale, you know, as soon as I finished the, I think the Savage Season, maybe, that he which was a kind of a crime horror novel that he wrote, I was like, okay, I'm going to check out the rest of this guy's work. Ditto uh, mystery author Andrew Bax. You know, I mean, I all but ran to the library to see what other Vax books they had after I finished reading the novel Strega. How do you spell his last name? Oh, jeez. Uh... I think it's V A C H S S. Okay. Yeah. If you start typing in Andrew V A C, it'll pop up. Okay. Good to know because I was also, I believe we talked about this on another show last week. Uh, we talked about him as an author. And I wrote it down in my notes, but I couldn't figure out how to spell it. So I've just got like three different spellings for it. Yeah, it's one of those names where it's like, what? Yeah, the, the, the like the last four letters or consonants, like they don't, like, uh, is it V-A-C-C-H-S? I think it's V-A-C-H-S-S, -S, but do not pro- <laughs> Hold me to that. It's like trying to read French. You look at it and you're like, I know half of these syllables are not pronounced. Yeah. But I will warn you, his stuff is rough. You know, I mean, if you've ever read Elmore Leonard or such, Think of that as the suburbs and Andrew Vax is deep in the inner city. So.
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve heads. Yay, I'm almost to the halfway mark for heads. Okay, these ones up here, <clears throat> excuse me, good lord. These ones won't take quite as long because they're gonna be slightly obscured by a digital effect when it's actually printed, but I still have to put in some amount of detail or it'll look really cheesy. Okay, next week is, okay. Oh, um, we are able to have the show next Monday since I am gonna be still in town. Are you still up for that or not? Uh, yeah, no, I can I can definitely put it on the schedule. Um, we will cut uh, five minutes early because for those of you guys in the chat who know about this or know this show, Keep Crawling with uh, Mike and Brendan is going to be making a return at 9 p.m. So. But I mean, there's no reason not to not to do it next week. If I am reading the emails from the art director correctly, I will be working on Dark Tower next week. I have the work order, but I have not had time to do anything with it yet. You know, maybe it'd be because, you know, I've been drawing one, two, three, two, fun, two, two frigging many heads. Mm. Mm. 
course got to do my almost patented you know stress lines and such on the all the rocks and such I probably would have made my life a lot simpler if I had not chose to do with the torch providing a dramatic lighting, but I think it does help. So what's going on in chat? Anything? Or is it a quiet Monday night? Oh, uh, I checked my email real quick because I asked, you mentioned Matt and my brain was like, all right, I asked Matt a question about OBS earlier. So let me look at chat and I will tell you. Um, so what? You got a skinwalker in there? Uh, somebody out walking their dog, obviously. <laughs> that scared me. <laughs> yeah. Um, Fregling asks, uh, did you sneak an Easter egg in there? Uh, something like Harley's head. Um, um, you know, if I'd have had more time to figure out and everything that's going on, you know, um, yeah, I probably should have, like, you know, emailed all the uh, writers and artists and had them send me headshots. Because I think it would have been hysterical. Well, actually, this one does look a little bit, little bit like Harley. He's got about the right amount of hair. <laughs> uh, Grape, Ips, Grape 8 says uh, that there's still time to put uh, Joe's head in there. <laughs> tell you what i'll do it and i'll and when joseph uh e emails me about it i was like oh oh i was put up to it by grape ape i know pictures like this are usually a great one for in jokes speaking of which if we ever get back to doing uh back to work on X Crawl, I need to do something for uh for you, Alana. I've already done something for Joe, for Brendan, for Matt, for Jess, for Dieter Zimmerman, and I forget who all else. Oh, and uh Brian that used to uh do the warehouse. Oh dear. So, I'll have to figure out something to do for you and Thorin. I'm not sure what yet. First, we gotta get back to the bloody project. Mm. 
I miss my X crawl. What can I say? One of these days, I've got to get into uh, an X crawl game and play because I it would be so much fun. I I've watched them being played, but I've never actually been at the table. I've only played X crawl once, but it was a hoot. I think I played a uh, dock worker who had uh, delusions that 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 was going to be his, uh, you know, path to uh, fame. It didn't work out so well, but still, you know. But yeah, I loved the game X Crawl. Basically, what ever since it first came out at origins 2002 maybe when it was still uh brett brooks when he was running panda head you know so i probably got one of the first like 100 100 uh copies that were actually sold but yeah And then when I found out that, you know, they were going to start doing it, I remember emailing Joseph immediately, like, who do you need me to kill so that I can work on X crawl? I mean, how many games can you think of? where you can legitimately do ads for sunglasses and pop and monster drinks literally monster drinks sometimes i believe it was oh boy what game was that um i think it was the x crawl tournament during empire of the cyclops con I believe mm -hmm. I did the finals. I I ran the finals on stream, and I remember, uh, I remember they had, I think one of the rooms was based on those old. Oh, what were they? They were like the '80s and '90s versions of, like tricks and Count Chocula and Lucky Charms. Oh, oh geez. Oh man, that was great! If you guys haven't seen that, we've got um, we've got the vod up on the YouTube. Uh, I will try to remember, and I'm saying this out loud so that editing future Elena can, you know, put it in her brain. Link that below in the description. Right. right. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, X Crow is one of those games that I can get very evangelical about. Because if nothing else, it always drives me crazy in your average, you know, D and D etc. type game. Why are all these monsters hanging out in this, you know, dungeon together? It makes no sense. You know. You know why would a werewolf be hanging out on the? 10th level of a dungeon, you know, right next to a room full of goblins that's also right next to a room full, a room with a dragon in. That makes no sense whatsoever, you know? Dungeon logic? I don't know. Yeah. But when you say like, oh, well, it's because it's basically a pay-per-view event and the monsters are being paid to be there. You know, so wait a minute, they're there. Yeah, because it's, you know, it, it's a, like an obstacle course, you know, you don't ask why bother asking why in, if somebody's running an obstacle course, why there's a pit full of water, followed by a something that you have to climb. You know, you know, it's just a it's part of the part of the obstacle course.
So, I mean, that's one thing that has always appealed to me about X-Crawl, that it rather tidily, you know, sidesteps the whole question of, like you just said, dungeon logic. But yeah, I might actually email Matt after we get off here tonight. It's like, hey, what's the what's the latest on X Crawl Classics? Because from what I understand, the manuscript is done. It's basically edited. So I mean it's ready to roll other than artwork. Fregling says, please tell us what you learned about x -Crawl. <laughs> What's that? Fregling says, please tell us what you learned about x -Crawl. Love sneak peeks. Like I said, I will email, I'm going to email him later. Like right now, I really don't remember what he said the holdup was. Unless it's maybe just that, you know, the production schedule got, has been so messed up because of the pandemic and everything. And that's the only thing I can think, because, you know. Got a random question for you. What is your favorite oh. Rush al album? Oh, um, that I'm afraid I can't really answer. Rush is one of those bands I enjoy when I hear them on the radio, but I've never gotten excited enough about their stuff to actually go out and go like, okay, I'm gonna find this album and I'm gonna buy it and I'm gonna check it out. Um, I kind of have the same situation with Pink Floyd. It's like, okay, they're cool, they're technically brilliant, but they just don't really do very much for me. Uh, at heart, I'm more of a Roots Rock kind of guy. Um, like Creams Clearwater Revival, uh, Rockabilly, stuff like that. Yes, I know, I just spoke heresy, because I know some people, you don't, dare say anything about Pink Floyd or Rush. But it just... I mean, I recognize that they're both really skilled groups, but... Not gonna lie, 
that's how I feel about um, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Like, they were everywhere on the radio all the time when I was growing up. And mm -hmm. I liked their songs, but there was nothing special to me about them other than the, the songs were catchy. I would get... Um, I can't even remember the title of their song now, but it was the it was the one um, where he talks about the chick with a southern with like the scarlet drawl, like she sounds she sounds like she's from Georgia, you know, Gone with the Wind reference. But like hmm. it's that song. I can't remember the title of it. I just know that line, and hmm. it would get stuck in my head in high school because it was always on the alt-rock radio station on my way to school. Oh. Yeah, that doesn't even ring any bells. But after, was it Mother's Milk? I just kind of like, okay, Andrew, I get, Anthony, I get the idea. You're the Red Hot Chili Peppers, yada, yada, yada. And I went back to my oldies collection. just can tell you basically i am a machine when it comes to music from before like 1977 and around about about that time i was kind of like okay whatever dun, 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 dun. you know now like i said give me some good old ccr or even some very old heavy metal old country and i'm a happy puppy But for the most part, and I'm a horrible one because, like, I did do my listening to, you know, the top 40 kind of stuff when I was growing up, yada, yada, yada. But one thing that didn't help me was the job that I had for the longest time. It was at a the station that they listened to where I worked. They basically had a playlist of 20 songs. And they would just play those over and over and over. Um, anyone in the Toledo area that knows 92.5 will know what I'm talking about. Because ostensibly they're a top 40 station. But they are literally top 20. And I mean, I could actually time because they would literally just play 20 through one and restart 20 through one about every hour and 45 minutes. You know, if you're working a 10 hour shift, that means you're going to be hearing the same song at least five times. That's what it was like working at a mall. Especially if you had a store that was just fancy enough to have a greeter and you got stuck as the greeter because you would stand there and not only would you hear the songs that constantly played in your store, but you would constantly hear the top 20 playlist that was going on in the mall. Oh God, kill and me And heaven now. forbid it was Christmas time. Because oh, Jesus God, no. Not only did you have Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You constantly playing, but at the time, Frozen was really popular. Like, it had mm. just come out, like, the year prior or whatever, and Let It Go was a Christmas song. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, pretty much uh, my opinion of that particular song is take a sharp, sharp object to my ears and then let it go. Yeah, no. Yeah, I remember a few years ago, uh, they were having a sale at one of those like Bed Bath & Beyond or something like that. One of those little big boutique stores that sell stuff. And I had to go in with Jess for some reason, and I got to talking to the girl behind the counter. And mind you, this was early, early November. We're talking like November 3rd or 4th, okay? And we were in there for a while, and it's like, 
long enough to realize it's like, oh dear God, this is all off one CD. And I got to talking to the girl behind the counter and she's like, yeah, they have, they were selling, they were promoting this one CD that the company had put out and it's only like 10 songs. Okay. So, and that was all they were allowed to listen to the same 10 songs on repeat. I actually said, I am so sorry for you, ma'am. Mm hmm Right. <laughs> so yeah. But yeah. Well, and just can testify to this. Um, the same place that I was telling you about that, you know, got, got, took to playing the top 40 station. Um, before that, there was another long before that there was a we listened to another station star 105.5. And from 8 to midnight, every night, they played nothing but love songs. Now, and we're not talking like love songs from, or romantic songs from the whole breadth of pop, of top 40 and pop music. We're talking everything just from the past, the previous two years and, and what was in the top 40 at that time. Yeah. And I was working full time, so I was basically working five to six nights every week. So you're talking four times five, generally at least 20 to 24 hours every week of nothing but love songs. Boys to Men, Anita, Anita Blake, does that something? No. She was real popular in the 90s. Anyhow, you get the idea. Yeah, I'm really bad at remembering artists' names. Yeah. Anyhow, to this day, for the most part, I still can't listen to romantic music without wanting to, pay, to, to take a chainsaw to my wrists. Man, I, trust me, I completely get it. Because I have, I'm pretty sure the reason why, I wouldn't necessarily say I despise it, okay? I won't say I despise it. But, for the most part, I can't listen to pop music, like, at all. I refuse to listen to pop music because I was subjected to so many years in retail where mm -hmm. rock music just isn't popular at malls. They're just not, unless you work at, like, Hot Topic or FYE or some other alt store, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you go into the mall, the top 40 pop music is playing over the speakers, then you go into all of these, you know, stores, department stores, other clothing stores, Bath and Body Works, all of these different places, all pop music that's similar to the top 40 list or is someone's, you know, CD of pop music and mm -hmm. then 
you go in and then you just go around the mall and you hear the same songs and sometimes the playlist is really weird and the random you know the random shuffle doesn't actually shuffle so you've been in the in the mall for about two hours and you're like i just heard this song you know two hours ago <laughs> oh god yeah um back when i was in college um i was catching a ride to my student teaching up at a school about 25 30 miles from uh, where i lived okay so it was a fairly decent pretty long commute and there were two pop stations out of Toledo, the 93 that I was just mentioning in 92.5, okay? This was when that song Kokomo by the Beach Boys was popular. Do you remember that? Da, 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 da. We heard it. <coughs> they kept bouncing back and forth between the two stations, the people I was riding with. We heard it like five or six times between Bowling Green and Toledo. I cannot listen to the Beach Boys now without basically wanting to throw up. <coughs> and the funny thing is, I grew up on the Beach Boys. You know. Yeah, unpopular op opinion. Um, I don't really like the song Pretender <laughs> by the Foo Fighters because oh. it used to play all the time on the radio like anywhere that remotely had any kind of rock music they played the pretenders and i don't hate the song i just don't enjoy it as much anymore oh see i've never been a big i've never been a real big fan of david grow as a musician as a human being i think they should nominate him for pope as a as a musician I'm at best mediocre on his stuff. Of course, I also despite I was, you know, around when every when Nirvana was popular, and you know, you know, there was a while there where you could not turn on any station and not hear Nirvana. That was about when I started really working on making sure that I had, you know, a large enough tape and music collection that I never had to worry about the radio. You know, I used to drive my uh, boss at the time crazy because, you know, we had some insane deadlines that we would have to meet because I was the staff illustrator at GDW and I was basically doing, well, like I said, but, you know, the 90 illustrations for that one book. So I had a the best of James Brown, the best of the Ramones, and the first Body Count album with Ice T's a hardcore group, and I would just listen to those in rotation because both Ramones Mania and James Brown were like forty songs each. So by the time you got done with listening to all three of them, you know that was like what eight nine almost a hundred songs but it drove him absolutely crazy uh ford fitch says that uh he he had a or they had a uh tr two-week road trip through colorado where the only music available was a john denver album and the folks insisted on playing it over and over again God loves I don't, God knows I love me some John Denver, especially his Toledo song, but I don't think I could deal with that much John Denver. Thank you anyhow. Oh, by the way, so, hi hi Ford, nice to nice nice to know you tuned in. I remember taking road trips uh, with my parents to Florida uh, because we would spend so we would spend our vacation money like we would save up every couple of years and we'd spend our vacation down in florida going to the orlando resorts so right. because we wanted to go to universal and we're just like well it's cheaper to get the package deal stay at a resort and get you know day pass tickets for every time you're for every day that you're at the hotel you can you know take the stupid little ferry over the river there you go you're at the resort so we would do that and 
I would bring my CD player because this was before. This was before um, I uh, not iPads, but um, oh god, what were the MP3 players called? Oh god, Walkmans. Not the Walkmans. They're the. It was the Apple, like the the. It was before I... MP3 players got really big. I iPods, iPods. That's iPod, what they were yeah. Called. And uh, so we. So before those existed, I had a CD player. And so I would have to put in my CD player halfway through the trip because the first half of the trip, we would listen to a Ray Stevens comedy song album, <laughs> which I enjoyed. And to this day, I could still sing uh, the uh, Squirrel Went Berserk. Uh, I could still sing that song. And um, <laughs> they call him the streak. So... Oh, yes, they call him the streak. Getting <laughs> it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I don't know that song at all. <laughs> no, so we listened to the race. It was like the best of Ray Stevens or something like that. Was what the album was. So we'd plop that in. Um, we actually had to have one of those um, cassette tape to CD player because we had the oh, CD Jesus board, Christ. but the van that we would take to Orlando didn't have a CD player, so we had to plop in a cassette player that plugged into a CD player that my dad had to listen oh, to I it. Oh, re I remember those. Uh, that, that was how Jess's car used to be. That's how my Mustang was. Because <laughs> my CDs would get stuck in the CD player of my Mustang because it was so old. <laughs> <laughs> so I just got to the point where I'm like, once I got an MP3 player, uh, or once I, I fixed my MP3 player, and then I got a smartphone... Um, I started plugging in a cassette to plug into my headphone jack of my phone. But anyway, um, so the first half of the trip was Ray Stevens and uh, the barbecue album of, um, oh, what was it called? It was uh, Space Coast Coast to Coast came out with an album that was like a bunch of, it was like Space Coast... Uh, Backyard Barbecue or something like that was the oh, name geez, of the scene. I have no clue. I don't know why. we were pl Those were the first half of our trip. And then the second half would be whatever my dad wanted to listen to. So it would be whatever was on the radio that he could find. And a lot of the times it was if we couldn't find a classic rock station, it was uh, country music at the time. And so I, I hate country music, or at least when I was in high school, I hated it, or middle school and high school, well, I hated yeah. it. So I would listen to, like, Evanescence, Within Temptation, uh, Lincoln Park. I had, like, my entire CD collection <laughs> with me in the back seat. So it was like, I was re very happy that, you know, I got a CD player for Christmas one year so that I didn't have to listen to the crappy radio stations on our, like, nine-hour trip down to Orlando. God. yeah. <laughs> that was one nice thing. Uh, my dad had fairly good taste in music, you know, and so did my mom for the longest time. I mean, I think my mom introduced me to Chuck Berry, for God's sakes. See, you know? I liked my dad's taste of music when he remembered to bring his CDs, like his entire CD collection, but most of the time we would just, like, whatever was in my grandpa's van at the time was what we listened to, which is how we found the Ray Stevens album, is it was in a pocket in one of the seats of the van. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Never, yeah, n never, never be forced to rely on your grandparents' musical tastes. Oh, no, never. <laughs> you know. My grandparents thought that Lawrence Welk was, uh, like, heavy metal. Yeah. See, my dad, my dad introduced me to Man of War. Um, <coughs> there was a, oh, I can't remember the band that did it. Uh, it was a song called Santa Maria is, like, my favorite song by them, and I cannot remember the band. It was similar in style, uh, less heavy than man of war but similar in style to their ballads hmm. um let me not see if i sure can actually find one. them not sure yeah don't get me started on british heavy metal you know i could cheerfully listen to iron maiden and some of the the groups like that all day
Yeah, actually, one of my favorite groups. What did was a group called Briton Rights, and they actually like name checked like Nyarlathotep and Yog Sothoth and such, and they broke after up after one out al one album. You know, I'm looking like they're referencing Robert E. Howard stories, and not like common ones. Yes, uh, I gotta get everything that, by them that I've. Oh, I guess I have everything they've ever recorded. But yeah, I mean any any group that references a Solomon Cain story is golden in my eyes. I mean, you can find most all of their stuff on YouTube. You know. Don't even try to find the actual album unless you're basically uh, Bill Gates. You know, because it was like 1976 or so. You know, it's so probably so far out of date, it's not, or out of print, it's, you know, I'm not even sure the, the surviving members of Britain Rights remember the, the, their album. <sighs> Have you ever heard of Sabaton? Oh god, yes. Okay, I was about to say, I feel like you'd like Sabaton. <laughs> oh, I adore Sabaton. Yeah, they're there's so no, cool. There's, no, there's no, nothing quite like, wow, it's like history class with balls. <laughs> it's history class, but metal. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, I love Sabaton. For those of you who have never heard of Sabaton, uh, they're a Swedish. Oh, I couldn't tell you. I can't remember. A power metal group, but instead of just doing whatever songs that, you know, spring to mind, all of their stuff is based on military history. Like, one is based on, like, the events of World War One, World War II, another one on World War II, uh, and one is actually, like, loosely adapted from uh, Sun Tzu's The Art of War. And it is literally, the album is literally called The Art of War. And it has a female narrator quoting from the book. Plus what completely irrelevant to the actual music, I saw this utterly charming clip on YouTube um, from one of their concerts. So this kid, this guy had brought his son to the uh, concert and ended up more or less in the front row. And the lead singer saw that, and the kid was wearing a, a tiny little Sabaton shirt, which I thought was utterly hysterical. So the next thing you know, he's, you know, gesturing and inviting the little kid up on stage and singing to him, you know? And he ended up getting like a bottle of water and the drummer gave him one of his drumsticks and the kid was just, you know, glowing. It was like, oh, you can't tell these guys are parents that are, are starting to feel lonesome for their families at all. So yeah. So anybody who likes some good, very literate, and it's not super heavy, you know. I mean, what would you say? It's kind of like I don't know, Iron Maiden on a on an off day, maybe kind of thing. Mm hmm Okay.
I just realized I wasn't muted that entire, or I was muted that entire time. Holy crap. Anyway, Oops. so uh, for those of you uh, listening to Brad react and going, huh, I wonder what she's saying. I was saying one thing that I appreciate with Sabaton is the fact that they have uh, lyrics in their YouTube videos so that when I stop paying attention to the words, I can actually, you know, see what they're saying. <laughs> Yeah. And plus it's fun. It's like a quick, you know, some of them are literally like quick history lessons. I think they have one about Stalingrad, don't they? Yeah, it's been a while since I've listened to them. Uh, I was just thinking about it because someone sent me a video of theirs a couple weeks back. But yeah. Yeah, it's, but yeah, they're, they're one of the relative, they're one of the relatively few metal bands that I really like, you know. What time is it? Oh God, it's almost time to get the hell out of here, isn't it? Mm-hmm. How time flies when you're having heads. I mean, wait a moment. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> oh, uh, I just I just realized that Frigling asked a question. Which Disney movie does this drawing represent? Return to Oz, maybe? Um, actually, from everything I've heard of the movie Return to Oz, quite possible. I've never got around to watching it. I guess it's pretty freaking demented. Yeah. Also, uh, Jess has redeemed a random Joker fact uh, to end the night with. Okay. Drum roll, please. I, I I have I have to admit I'm partially guilty on this one because I was the one who she was going to pass on this and I said no that that's too bad not to include. This is one for all the literature fans out there, okay? So you know, put it down your smoking your your pipe and uh, your smoking jacket and listen to this joke. What do you get when you cross alcohol and literature? Tequila Mockingbird. Okay, and on that note, folks, I think we are done for the week. Uh, we will be here next week, uh, again, from 7 to, basically 7 to about 8.45, 8.50. Uh, so you can all have time to, uh, you know, run, run to the little girls or boys room before, I'm sorry, crawling, what? I blanked on the name of the, the show. Right. In the meantime, I hope to finish this, and then I am taking a few days vacation, and then I will be back working on Dark Tower, and I shall see you all next week. Thank you for tuning in. Peace out. Bye. <laughs>